In tonight's Fact or Fiction, we're looking into a story that you may have seen online. It claims Nostradamus predicted Queen Elizabeth would die in 2022. In reality, Nostradamus's writings are vague and they make no predictions specific to British royalty in 2022. Prophecies are becoming a reality. The first was the terrible event in which the Titan submarine had a devastating accident, just as a prophecy had predicted. The second was about warnings issued long ago by Nostradamus concerning a major war, similar to what is happening with Ukraine and Israel. Now the truth is that this is just the tip of the iceberg. There is more to come. Join us in exploring the 10 prophecies that are happening this year. Chapter 1 the Prophecy of St. Malachi In the 12th century, St. Malachi was a very important church leader. He was the Archbishop of Armagh, which means he was a big deal in the church in Ireland. He worked really hard to make changes in the church that he thought were needed. He wanted the church in Ireland to do things the way the Roman church did, including the way they held their services. He also made sure the church took better care of people who needed help, followed church rules more strictly, and encouraged the church to celebrate its special ceremonies more carefully. St. Malachi also went on a big trip to Rome, where he met other important church leaders, like St. Bernard of Clairvaux. He even started a new church building, called the Abbey of Mellifont, showing how dedicated he was to making his faith stronger and helping the church grow. There's also a famous story about St. Malachi predicting the future of the popes, the leaders of the whole Roman Catholic Church, with something called the Prophecy of the Popes. He supposedly wrote down 112 short clues in Latin that were supposed to tell us about each pope from his time all the way to the end of the world. These clues could be about the pope's name, where he came from, or something special about him. This story has made a lot of people very curious and a bit confused for a long time, because it's hard to tell if these predictions are real or just made up. The thing is, nobody even saw these predictions until about 450 years after Malachi was supposed to have written them, which was in 1595. That's a long time. Because of this, some people think maybe the predictions were made up much later to try to influence who would become Pope or to support someone's chances of being chosen as Pope. For example, there was a hint that the next Pope would come from the old city, and some think this was a sneaky way to support a man named Cardinal Girolamo Simoncelli because he was from a place called Orvieto, which could be called an old city. Even though some of the clues seem to match the popes before the predictions were made public, they don't seem to fit as well for the popes who came after. This makes people think that maybe the predictions were just made up after the fact to look like they were real prophecies. At the end of the predictions, there's a big finale about someone called Peter the Roman, who is supposed to be the last pope before the end of the world. This has made a lot of people wonder and guess, especially about recent popes and how they might fit into these predictions. But it's important to remember that the Catholic Church doesn't officially say these predictions are true, and many think of them as more of an interesting story from history than something to believe in. So. While St. Malachi did a lot of important things for the church that people remember and respect, the predictions that are said to be his are taken with a grain of salt. They're an interesting mix of mystery, history, and politics that has left a lasting impression, but they're not something that the church bases any decisions on. Next, we dive into a world where science dreams of endless energy, inspired by the power of the stars. Chapter 2 Free energy. The idea of getting energy from fusion is really exciting because it's like having an endless supply of clean energy, similar to the sun's power. The goal is to figure out how to do what the sun does right here on Earth. This means we need to get hydrogen atoms to join together at super high temperatures, which then releases a lot of energy. Scientists have been working hard on this and have made some cool discoveries. One big project involves a team from MIT and a company called Commonwealth Fusion Systems. They created a super strong magnet that can handle the hottest temperatures needed for fusion. 
This magnet is super important because it holds the plasma, which is like a very hot soup of particles, in place so that the fusion can happen without destroying anything around it. Fusion energy is better than the kind of nuclear power we use now for a few reasons. It doesn't create as much dangerous waste, the materials we need for it are pretty common, and it's safer. But it's still really hard to do. We need to get everything just right. The heat, the pressure, and keeping the plasma contained for long enough, all without spending too much money. Plus, we have to figure out what to do with the neutrons that come out during the process, because they can wear out the parts of the reactor. People are trying to make fusion work in a couple of main ways. One is called a tokamak, and the other is called inertial confinement fusion. Big projects like the Eider Tokamak in France and the National Ignition Facility in the US are working on these methods. There's also some work being done on other ideas that might be cheaper. The basic idea behind fusion is simple. When two small atomic nuclei come together, they make a bigger nucleus and let off some energy. But to get them to come together, we must overcome their natural push away from each other. This means we must heat them up and squeeze them together until they fuse. The sun does this all the time, naturally. But for us to do it on Earth, we need some really advanced equipment. Even though it's a big challenge, the benefits of getting fusion to work would be huge. It could give us a clean, almost unlimited power source and change how we get our energy. We've made a lot of progress, but more work remains to be done. Scientists and engineers continue inventing and trying new things to make fusion energy a reality. Now, we explore how technology might blur the line between life and what comes after, offering us a glimpse into eternity. Chapter 3. The Future Fusion Ray Kurzweil is a very important person in technology and thinking about the future. He was born in Queens, New York in 1948 and has done a lot of work in making computers smarter and thinking about how people and technology can come together. He's known for creating new ways for computers to understand patterns and has talked a lot about how humans and machines might eventually become one. His ideas cover a lot of areas like smart computers, writing computer programs, and ideas about how humans might change in the future. Kurzweil thinks that one day, people and machines will join together, which could mean we could live forever and become much smarter. He believes this because he's noticed that technology gets better and more powerful in a way that's fast and keeps speeding up. He calls this the law of accelerating returns, which means that the more we learn about technology, the faster we can make new discoveries. He says that there will be three big changes in the future because of genetics, tiny technology, nanotechnology, and robots. He imagines a future where we can change our bodies to stop getting old and sick, make new kinds of materials and gadgets that are very small, and build robots that are better at solving problems than people are. In a talk with a company called McKinsey, Kurzweil explained how fast technology is growing and how it will change the way we do business and live our lives. He talked about how smart computers will be a big part of our lives, how we might cure diseases like cancer by changing our genes, and how we could use the power from the sun to solve energy problems. Kurzweil's ideas are based on his law of accelerating returns, which he wrote about in a book called How to Create a Mind. He believes that once something becomes part of technology, it starts to improve very quickly. This idea has helped him make some very good guesses about how technology will change, like predicting smart computers that can win at chess or help doctors. Even though not everyone agrees with Kurzweil, many people who make technology, and even governments, listen to what he has to say. They use his ideas to think about big problems, like stopping dangerous diseases or finding new ways to make energy. His positive view on how technology can improve the world keeps making people talk and think about what the future could be like for all of us. Moving on, we meet a powerful leader wrapped in mystery, where stories and reality meet. Chapter 4. Vladimir Putin, Lord of the World When we dive into the world of predictions and the role of leaders like Vladimir Putin, Russia's mysterious and powerful president, we find ourselves in a space filled with wonder and doubt. People view Putin in terms of prophecies and his impact on the globe in two main ways. 
Some see him as a central character in religious and mystical forecasts, suggesting he's destined to play a major role in future events. On the flip side, there are those who question these predictions, relying on facts and logical thinking to dispute such claims. Let's start by exploring the biblical prophecies, especially the one found in Ezekiel 38. This ancient text mentions a Prince of Rosh, which some believe points directly to Russia's leadership, with Putin possibly being the person described. According to this interpretation, Putin's actions are in line with major events prophesied to happen before Jesus Christ returns to earth. This view places Putin in a light far beyond just a political leader. It suggests he's a symbol of significant spiritual importance, hinting at big shifts in how the world works and in spiritual beliefs. Now, let's consider a different kind of prophecy made by Baba Vanga, a blind mystic known for her incredible ability to predict the future. Back in 1979, she foresaw Russia under Putin's rule, becoming a superpower described as the Lord of the World with Europe left in ruins. Vanga's visions didn't stop there. She also predicted various global catastrophes and conflicts, emphasizing Putin's role in these future events. Her prophecies have intrigued and captured the imagination of many people, painting Putin and Russia's global role in a mystical and fascinating light. These stories about Putin, whether seen as fulfilling ancient predictions or as subjects of mystical foresight, spark many reactions. Some people fully believe in these prophecies, while others remain skeptical, pointing out that the interpretations of ancient texts like the Bible can be highly subjective and often adjusted to fit current events. Similarly, the accuracy of mystics like Baba Vanga is debatable, given their predictions broad and often ambiguous nature. No matter where you stand on these prophecies, they significantly shape how people view Vladimir Putin and his place on the international stage. To some, he's a figure straight out of prophecy, poised to fulfill grand, ancient predictions. To others, he's a subject of speculation, embodying the fascinating intersection of politics, prophecy, and our collective curiosity about the future. Expanding on these ideas, the discussion around Putin and prophecies reflects broader themes of belief, skepticism, and the human desire to understand our place in the world. It's not just about one leader or one set of predictions. It's about how we interpret signs and symbols in our search for meaning, reconcile ancient texts with modern events, and navigate the uncertain waters of future predictions. This conversation invites us to reflect on the power of narrative, the allure of the unknown, and the endless human quest to predict and shape the future. We then imagine a future where our thoughts connect us, creating a silent conversation that spans the globe. Chapter 5. Telepathy and Social Network of Brains Ian Pearson, a thinker from the UK, has big dreams about the future. 2040 at the earliest, my guess is 2050, uh, it'll be a few rich people and a few kings and queens here and there and politicians. He believes that by the year 2050, we might be able to stop aging and even death thanks to science. He pictures a world where we could use 3D printers to make new organs and change our genes to stop our cells from getting old. This way, we could swap out the old parts in our bodies whenever needed. He thinks this idea could work because technology is getting better really fast making some people believe we could live forever. Pearson also thinks about a future where we could move our minds into robot bodies. He compares it to borrowing a car with our thoughts living online and moving into any robot body to explore the real world. This isn't just a dream. There are technologies today that let people who can't move control gadgets or fake limbs just by thinking. And with the sex industry making more lifelike dolls, the idea of using robot bodies for our minds doesn't seem so strange. He even suggests another idea where we wouldn't need physical bodies at all. Instead, we could live in a computer-generated world, connecting our minds with lots of others. This could make us super smart and let us be in many places at once. But Pearson warns that at first, only very rich people might be able to use these technologies. It could take 10 to 15 years before more people can afford them. Looking into money matters,
Pearson thinks that by 2060, regular folks might be able to buy this technology, and by 2070, even people in poorer countries could have it. He hopes the cost will go down so much that one day, it might be given out for free by healthcare systems. This could mean everyone could have electronic immortality, no matter how much money they have. But chasing forever life is not without its problems. There are big questions about fairness, how it affects the planet, and what life would be like if we could live much longer. There's worry that living longer could make rich and poor people even more unequal, and people might get bored or stuck if they live too long. These issues show why it's important to think carefully about making and using technologies to make life longer. We need to make sure they're used fairly and wisely. Pearson's future vision is exciting and full of tough questions. As we get closer to making living forever a real possibility, we'll have to think hard about the ethical, social, and economic effects of these big changes. We'll need to work together to make sure the future is good for everyone. Our exploration takes us into the heart of matter, where a dream of perfect energy could change everything. Chapter 6. Superconductivity at Princeton University, a team of scientists has found a sudden change in the way quantum particles behave in a material that's only three atoms thick. This material can switch from being an insulator, which doesn't conduct electricity, to a superconductor, which conducts electricity without any resistance. They've discovered that by changing how many electrons are in the material, they can control its superconducting properties. This has led to the finding of a new kind of critical point in quantum physics that goes against what was previously thought. This discovery is very important because it could help us understand more about how quantum physics works in solid materials. Meanwhile, over at MIT, researchers have found out something interesting about iron selenide, a material that becomes superconductive at high temperatures. They've learned that the atoms in this material change their energy levels together, but not in the way people thought before. Instead of moving in a coordinated way because of magnetic forces, they're shifting because of their orbital energy. This suggests a completely new way of looking at how superconductivity can happen, which is different from the old ideas. It's exciting because it shows there are many different ways superconductivity can occur, which we hadn't understood fully before. At Cornell University, another team has made a big step forward by finding a new kind of quantum state called a topological pair density wave, PDW, in a material called uranium ditelluride. This state involves pairs of electrons forming a regular pattern like a crystal. This is a big deal because it helps us get a better grip on how superconducting materials work especially in materials where the superconductivity is very strong and can happen in different ways. Finding PDWs in materials like UTE2 is exciting because it shows the rich variety of superconductivity and opens up new paths for research in this field. These breakthroughs are part of what many are calling a golden age in the study of superconductors. They highlight the possibility of achieving superconductivity at room temperature something scientists have been dreaming about for a long time. If achieved, this could completely change the game for how we use energy, how quantum computers work, and even how things like trains can levitate using magnets. Niao, we look at how the future might move us from owning cars to sharing journeys in new ways. Chapter 7. No Car Ownership Talking about owning cars and what it might look like in the future is a big and complicated topic. Yet much evidence supports that owning a car is in decline and the prophecy can be real. It's influenced by how the economy is doing, what different age groups think, and new technologies in transportation. Some people think fewer people want to own cars these days, especially younger people like millennials. However, the real reason behind this trend seems to be more about money issues than a real change in wanting to use other ways to get around. Research shows that the big economic downturn a while back made it harder for younger people to stand on their own financially, which made it tough for them to buy cars. Studies have found that millennials who have managed to get stable financially are just as likely, or even more likely, to own cars as older generations 
once you consider how much money and assets they have. This means that the story about fewer people wanting to own cars might be more about financial struggles than a clear decision to not buy cars. Even though there's a push for using more eco-friendly and shared ways to get around, in many places in the U.S., things are still set up in a way that really makes having your own car the best option. This is different from cities in Europe, where public transport and sharing cars are easier options. But, without studies like those done in the U.S., it's hard to say for sure if people's choices or money situations are mainly what's affecting car ownership trends there. Owning a car isn't just about needing it to get from point A to point B. It's also about the status and freedom it brings, which is really important in many cultures. In places like India and China, more and more people are buying cars as they get richer and because having a car is seen as a sign of success. Looking into other ways to get around, like using apps to call a ride, sharing cars, or self-driving cars, is important for improving city travel and helping the environment. But so far, our information doesn't show that everyone will stop owning personal cars anytime soon. Cars still give a level of convenience and freedom that can't be matched. Meeting the wide-ranging needs and wants of people at different times in their lives and in different places. As we consider the future of food and survival, we face a grim prophecy that warns of a desperate choice. Chapter 8. Cannibalism on Earth Nostradamus was a famous astrologer from France who lived in the 1500s. He's well known for making predictions about what he thought the future would hold that are both fascinating and a bit scary. One of the scariest things he predicted was a future where people would be so poor and food would be so scarce that they might start eating each other. He imagined a world where life was incredibly hard, food was insufficient, and everything was too expensive, forcing people to do unthinkable things. His predictions are called quatrains because they're written in poems with four lines each. Understanding them is really difficult because they're not clear or direct. Over the years, many people have tried to figure out what he meant, trying to connect his old predictions to things happening now, like when prices go up or when we're facing big problems with the environment. People are curious about whether what Nostradamus said might be happening today. But there's a lot of disagreement about what he really meant by his mysterious words. His predictions are so vague and can be taken in so many ways that it's hard to say what he was talking about. For instance, when he talks about tough times leading to cannibalism, he doesn't say when this will happen or where. This makes people interpret his words in all sorts of ways sometimes linking them to things happening in the world or worries about what might happen in the future. Some think his predictions are like warnings, telling us that bad things could happen if we don't start making big changes, especially in handling differences between rich and poor people and taking care of our planet. Even though Nostradamus' predictions are intriguing, we must remember he lived centuries ago, in a very different time. His ideas about the future were based on astrology and what people knew back in the 1500s. Some people enjoy thinking about how his predictions might line up with current events, but scientifically, there's no proof that he could really predict the future. Looking up, we witness the sun's power to awe and alarm, reminding us of its capacity to reshape our world. Chapter 9. Solar Tsunami Speaking scientifically, a solar tsunami is a massive wave made of hot gas and magnetic fields that moves across the sun. This wave can affect the weather in space and, as a result, can also impact our technology on Earth. This kind of solar activity is not just an event happening on the sun, it has had significant effects on Earth before. Studies show that big solar storms have hit our planet in the past, causing beautiful northern lights and problems with electrical systems. One notable example of such a storm happened about 9,200 years ago. Scientists found this out by looking at ice from Greenland and Antarctica, which had a lot of a certain type of atom that only appears after big solar storms. This ancient storm was much stronger than anything we've seen in recent history, even stronger than the famous Carrington event in 1859. What's interesting is that this huge solar storm happened during a time when the sun was supposed to be quiet, not active. 
if a storm like that were to happen today, it could cause a lot of trouble, not just for our gadgets and power systems, but also for pilots and space travelers because of the higher risk from radiation. On the other hand, some people believe solar tsunamis are warnings or messages from the divine, as seen on some prophecy websites. These prophecies suggest that big solar storms could seriously disrupt our lives by taking down power and communication systems, which some see as a signal for people to think about how they live and maybe make changes. Whether these prophecies will come true is a matter of debate and is often linked to whether people believe in spiritual or moral change, making it a crossroad of belief, predictions about the future, and science. Adding an extra layer of mystery, Baba Vanga, a mystic from Bulgaria who passed away, reportedly predicted a solar tsunami happening in 2023. She was known for her predictions. Adding an extra layer of mystery, Baba Vanga, a mystic from Bulgaria who passed away, reportedly predicted a solar tsunami happening in 2023. She was known for her predictions, some of which people believe have happened, like the Chernobyl disaster and the end of the Soviet Union, whether her predictions are accurate or how people interpret them varies, but her mentioning a solar tsunami mixes the scientific with the mystical, intriguing those who follow her predictions and skeptics as well. Now, the final frontier, where dreams of stepping into another world are closer than ever. Chapter 10. Mars Mission. This is more than just a trip. It's proof of our endless curiosity and our knack for creating incredible gadgets and tech. The dream of touching down on Mars has evolved from mere fantasy to a detailed blueprint, showcasing our ambition to push human presence way past Earth, reaching into the unknown depths of space. This tale isn't just a simple mission. It's an epic story of human cleverness, tough-as-nails endurance, and a burning question that's haunted us forever. Is Earth really the only inhabited planet? As our eyes and hopes are locked on Mars, the Red Planet teases us with the promise of untold stories and secrets. This isn't just about walking on new soil, it's about unraveling mysteries that have tempted the minds of both scientists and daydreamers for ages. Leading the charge are big names like NASA and SpaceX, alongside a band of international space clubs, all racing to peel back the layers of Mars examining its weather, terrain, and maybe even finding out if it ever hosted life. But getting to Mars is no walk in the park. Imagine hurtling through the cold, empty void of space, dodging deadly radiation and making a nail-biting landing on Martian ground. This requires the latest in tech, genius engineering, and an unstoppable will to succeed. However, the thought of discovering new worlds and possibly alien life keeps us going, the plan involves sending robots and landers packed with high-tech tools to scour Mars, hunt for water, and maybe, just maybe, find signs of ancient tiny life forms. Mars isn't just a new spot for science. It's the ultimate challenge for human dreams of expansion. With pioneers like Elon Musk leading the charge, the idea of making Mars our second home isn't just for sci-fi anymore. Imagine setting up cozy living spaces tapping into Mars's own treasures, and one day having a whole community thriving away from Earth. The dream of exploring Mars talks right to our collective hearts. A story about stepping into the great unknown, fueled by the hope of incredible finds that might just flip our understanding of existence and our spot in the universe on its head. What prophecy do you think is coming true this year? Share your thoughts below. Smash that like button and hit subscribe for more.